Uh, welcome, everybody, to this ISDP forum uh, that will today focus on the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC for short, and its political and social uh, effects implications on Pakistan. CPEC may be one of the biggest investment, single investment projects in the world currently, and also a major, if not the major, part of the more overarching Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. To help us guide us through this uh, big investment uh, project is uh, Ms. Uh, Merman from Pakistan. I would like to welcome her and an also as our keynote speaker. And I would also like to welcome our two commentators, Ms. Jaiji from Cypri and Ms. Uh, Dr. Henrik Chetan Aspengred from the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Starting with Ms. Memo, she has a very long and distinguished career in both public and private sector and was most recently the chairperson of the Benazir Income Support Program, the largest social safety net in Pakistan. And she also served as a federal minister on the government of Pakistan. She's also twice been a member of parliament and also served uh, as a chief executive officer of the satellite tracking company. Uh, we will first listen to Ms. Memon giving a keynote presentation on the impact of CPEC. And after that, I will invite our two commentators to a brief comment and then open up the floor for Q&A. Okay, so with that, Ms. Memon, please. Thank you very much. Um, organizers of the event, eminent, eminent uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure to be here in Stockholm with you at the ISDP uh, forum to discuss a subject of much importance to Pakistan, to China, to the region, and to the international community, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. I must commend the organizers for choosing such a controversial title. I must admit that before my exposure to European think tanks and universities this year specifically, I had very little appreciation of the extent of suspicion the CPEC is perhaps viewed with. I always knew that uh, certain Indian propaganda machines were working very strong uh, uh, on that CPEC, but did not realize the extent of their strength till I started conversing on certain subjects with academics in Europe. Therefore, the title chosen for today's talk did not surprise me completely, though I still had trouble grappling around the first part of the sentence, namely stirring tensions. Uh, we will discuss the CPEC at 360 degrees today, and hopefully by the end of this discussion with academics and political inputs included, we will reach, um, a, uh, we will reach I'm hopeful, a positive win-win conclusion. Um, at the outset, I do wish to say, therefore, that I'm grateful for this opportunity to as such clear the air on a project which is seen in Pakistan as a game changer. Clearly, any country which is seeing massive FDI, infrastructure, socioeconomic growth associated with the project is bound to see it as a game changer. However, Pakistan is conscious of the fact that this is a game changer for not just itself, but for the region and the world as well. There are two basic reasons for this strong belief inside Pakistan's political community. Firstly, the CPEC is seen as making Pakistan economically stronger. That will lead to a politically stable Pakistan. That will lead to political stability around the region, which will be good for the region and therefore for the international community. The classic international relations theory is at work here. The sum of the different parts in the international system make a stronger international system. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, when Pakistan wins economic stability through Chinese FDI and cooperation, it is hoped that Pakistan will lose any remnants of the word extremist that may have been associated with it in the past, and this will lead to a win-win for the world. In short, the better Pakistan uh, does to rid itself of extremist elements infiltrating from outside Pakistan, I must uh, specifically add, and affecting our economic stability, the better the world will do in its fight against terror. Now, I realize that there are a few regional elements who might feel threatened with a stronger Pakistan economically. They certainly would try and portray the entire CPEC project as a spurring tensions project. 
specifically because for them, an economically strong Pakistan might be perceived as a threat. However, I would call such neighbors short-term in their thinking, perhaps. Let us reverse the situation and take a different tangent for a minute. If Mr. Modi wins the election, he will be accelerating his ambitions for an extremist Hindu state, making a mockery of the secular, democratic, and tolerant India that is portrayed to the world. A short-term Pakistani politician will say yes to this winning because then India will lose economically, politically, and socially its so-called standing in the Committee of Nations. It would be a self-destructive exercise with no need of military war to destroy it. However, a long-term sensible approach would say that economically strong, stable neighbors is what the region needs, not warmongering, hate-oriented neighbors. In the same light, CPEC's success inside Pakistan would be to everyone's benefit if the prism, the narratives, and attitudes are changed. It is in this prism that I wish to proceed with the rest of the discussion today. And remember, when economies grow, inequities reduce. The world is aiming at achieving SDGs for all countries, not just a few. The international community needs to see economic growth as reducing poverty, extremism, and strife for all, not just a few. The second element of this spurring tensions is e China's economic growth as a result of the CPEC. That also should be seen in the regional context. If someone's gain is someone's loss in pure Hobbesian Machiavellian terms in the state of nature, then yes, CPEC might be viewed by some as exactly that. However, if a more new realistic approach is adopted, it should be seen as a brick-laying exercise which is spreading wealth versus spreading inequities. Furthermore, the China-Pakistan economic corridor in the geo-economic context of the region is being forecasted to witness a key turn in the shape of the world connectivity. Pakistan enjoys a geostrategic location which is unique. This is the connectivity China wishes to harness for itself primarily. If regional players are smart enough, they will piggyback on this bandwagon and take advantage of Pakistan's geostrategic location. If they're not, they will end up missing on the fruits of connectivity. With the introductory framework in place, I would like to proceed to the nuts and bolts of the CPEC as seen from a Pakistani politician's prism. Notwithstanding economic magnetism attached to CPEC, it has unleashed a plethora of opportunities by unbridling economic potentials of Pakistan. CPEC is becoming the massive center of gravity around which not only the regional and even extra-regional economies will thrive in the near future, but will act as catalyst to rejuvenate Pakistan's economy. Pakistan being at core of this flagship project of OBOR, or One Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, is apprenticed to face the upshots of this transformation proportionately. Consequently, CPEC will act as a game changer for Pakistan by stimulating economic growth by improving infrastructure, sector, power, and construction sector. It will attract FDI and modernize our economy through industrialization. The China-Pakistan relationship is entering a new era. This relationship has a personal people's angle, which the world must not ignore. It is central, in fact, and it is the result of the role Pakistan played in China's legitimate entry into the Committee of Nations, going back to the days of Chinese isolation and Pakistan's active diplomacy to help it break that. China has not forgotten those days. As a result, a deep friendship, often quoted as deeper than the K2, as higher than the K2, and deeper than the Arabian Sea, and sweeter than honey exists. It is etched in the minds of the people of both countries over many generations. This emotional people's relationship in diplomacy does pay dividends, whether anyone likes it or not, whether anyone understands its deep connection or not. It has outlived the changes within the internal and foreign policy of both countries, despite many upheavals. Its role in the CPEC project cannot be undermined. It serves, in fact, as a gravitational emotive point. The economic gravitation points are built on this bedrock of a people's relationship that needs to be better understood, perhaps, by the international community. The buy-in that CPEC has within Pakistan is unparalleled in uh, is unparalleled in political terms. There are only two issues in the recent history of Pakistan that I can personally vouch for which have such a clear-cut buy-in. 
Firstly, all politicians of all political parties in Pakistan and the military establishment stand together in the approach towards the resolution of Kashmir as per the United Nations re uh, resolutions. And now CPEC. There is not one person or one element who is out of sync internally on this issue. That in itself is a strength when it comes to changing democratic governments in Pakistan. Despite the changing uh, uh, political parties and the changes at the, at the political level, nobody has to date questioned the CPEC. In fact, as time has passed, the urgency to improve processes to make CPEC a reality faster has increased with each government. And this positive competition between political parties in Pakistan on trying to outdo each other's efforts on CPEC has seen an increase in momentum. That is good for Pakistan, for China, for the region, and I believe for the international community. Those external factors seen as blocking attempts for CPEC are not viewed, um, are not viewed positively. In the past, China-Pakistan relationship was mostly political in nature. In 2013, this relationship entered the dawn of CPEC era, turning our relationship to a full economic partnership. Chinese Premier Wen Jibao, while delivering his historic speech at the Parliament of Pakistan, summed up the Pakistan-China pa -China friendship in the following words. The steadfastness of the pine tree is shown in the frigid winter. The strength of a horse is tested in a long journey. It is interesting to note that before that, launching ceremony of CPEC in Pakistan, Chinese President Xi Jinping expressed his feelings in the following way. I feel as if I am going to visit the home of my own brother. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us look at the raw material potential, uh, raw material, uh, potential of Pakistan, human as well as natural resource raw material. Pakistan is home of an industrious, cultured, and resilient nation, which has braved numerous challenges and natural disasters. As the world's sixth largest nation, endowed with immense geostrategic significance and most battle-hardened armed forces, Pakistan today is emerging as a stable, strong, and prosperous country. It is a land of splendors with the world's largest irrigation system and a mass agriculture base. The country is bestowed with the cheapest resources of energy and all sorts of minerals, including world's third largest coal reserves. The big youth bulge makes Pakistan rich and attractive in human resource, particularly vibrant and growing middle class. 179 rec recognized universities are producing over half a million graduates, including thousands of PhDs every year, which are the backbone of the nation's human resource capital. China's One Belt, One Road initiative is a huge economic leap focusing on connectivity and economic cooperation. Let us not forget that the OBOR initiative is anchored around 60 countries and 4.4 billion people with combined GDP of 21 trillion US dollars. De the development strategy of OBOR consists of two main components, the land-based Silk Road economic belt, which includes six multiple economic corridors, and the ocean-going maritime Silk Route. Among these corridor, corridors, CPEC is unique as it connects and connects land-based economic belt to maritime Silk Route. It is a flagship product, a project of OBOR comprising networks of highways, railways, and pipelines. This is the strength of the CPEC, which no doubt is creating waves in the short-sighted who might be feeling intimidated with its scale and reach. CPEC is an initiative having dividends at local, global level with huge potential for regional economic integration, thereby opening up wide array of options for the world economy. The CPEC potential for trans-regional trade can be gauged by the volume of mutual trade in the region and transportation of oil. Located at the crossroads of huge supplying and consumption markets, Pakistan serves as an international interchange and bridge state as the corridor will reduce distance between Europe and Western China to less than half. Moreover, transportation time of oil imports from the Middle East and Africa will be reduced from over 30 days to just two days. The scale of productivity, GDP impacts, reduction in equities, scale of profitability is massive simply because time is money. However, I repeat, this is a regional win-win, not just a Pakistan-China win-win. Cost of goods will reduce 
when transportation costs reduce for the world. The international economies of scale will be impacted immediately and positively. And as we speak of it in futuristic terms, I would like us to remember the same vision of the Silk Route that China helped the region develop hundreds of years back. It had the same logic of accessing warm waters, and it certainly paved the way for colonial expansion and profitability beyond the region itself. Similarly, the CPEC has the same potential, but since technologies and times have changed, it has an impact on scales that could never have been envisaged in the past. Moreover, along the same historic lines, CPEC offers a historic opportunity of integration of diverse civilizations from Asia to Europe and Africa, allowing, allowing Pakistan to act as mediator of dialogue between civilizations in the 21st century. This, in today's context, is more relevant since Pakistan is the only Islamic nuclear power which has the potential to reduce hatreds, phobias, and connect people. This is certainly the need of the day when one looks at the trend of migration and, and um, the, um, the need for understanding each other better amidst white supremacy politics and Islamophobia. It is important, ladies and gentlemen, to list very co coherently the economic benefits for CPEC for Pakistan. The list of opportunities for Pakistan would be infrastructure development, balanced regional developments, overcoming energy crisis, industrialization, and export promotion, in agricultural development, service sector development, mining and quarrying development, development of the Gwadar port and Gwadar city, job creation, poverty alleviation, development of human capital and regional connectivity. In short, CPEC would turn Pakistan into an engine of growth prosperity. CPEC, once implemented fully, has the potential to transform Pakistan's economy from a low growth mode, 3%, to a high growth mode, 7 to 8%. For Pakistan, CPEC linking China's westernmost province of Xinjiang uh, 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 with the Pakistani port of Gwadar will upgrade Pakistan's infrastructure, addressing um, the daunting energy deficit and consequently enhancing the economic links between Islamabad and Beijing. CPEC has the potential to integrate marginalized areas of Pakistan while concurrently repelling in instance towards the status of Gilgit Baltistan. It would bring into the economic ambit stakes of other regional players, thus making it a regional common to infuse shared perspective on security and stability of the region. This regional common would certainly uh, would considerably dislodge a regional state of nature which is nothing but the contrived absence of stability in the region due to the durability of traditional notions of self-preservation and perennial conflict. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the benefits for China. It would provide Beijing with a much-needed alternative energy supply route, reducing its currently very high reliance on the volatile and U.S. influence route via the Straits of Malacca, and the South China Sea. Perhaps this is the insecurity which is creating notions of stirring tensions. Second, it would improve access to the rest of regions of Western China, bolstering their economic performance, and therefore fostering the all-important stability via development agenda pursued by the Communist Party. Third, it would create a new link between Central Asia and the Arabian Sea, thereby furthering China's image as a responsible promoter of win-win economic opportunities across the Euro-Asian region. What are the regional benefits of CPEG? Let us first examine the China-Iran relations, which are ch touching new levels of progress. President Xi Jinping uh, wrapped up his first Middle East tour in January 2016 with a visit to Iran, making him the first Chinese president to set foot in the Islamic Republic of Iran since 2002. China wants Iran to prioritize increased um, cooperation in energy, infrastructure, industrial cap capacity, and finance, all areas that fall under the larger subheading of cooperation on the Belt and Road Initiative. Those four areas featured prominently in China's discussion with most of its Belt and Road partners, including Iran. Under the Belt and Road Framework, China and Iran have set a goal of expanding their bilateral trade to U.S. $600 billion in the next 10 years, well, more than 10 times the level of U.S. $52 billion the two countries traded in 2014. Bilateral trade has surged $76 billion in 2017. China is already the largest importer of Persian Gulf oil. In terms of ports in the regional context, what needs to be understood is something which is perhaps misrepresented as deliberate propaganda. 
Gwadar and Chabahar port are not strategic rivals or competitors, just as Dammam and Dubai. All the four ports can complement each other to meet the energy needs of BRI countries. And this is the goal with CPEC and OBOR. It's a regional win-win, not just China's dominance over the rest of the region. Gwadar has an advantage by being a deep sea port, and the expansion of Chabahar would in fact expand trade through Gwadar. The in, this interdependent productivity is paralleled and mirrored at the CPEC level would help set the narrative straight for cooperation, not conflict. Larger vessels or super Panamax uh, uh, containers can easily dock at Gwadar. Planned oil pipelines or railways from Gwadar can ferry it to Kashgar, China. Pakistan is pre prepared to work with Iran to link the Gwadar port to Chabahar via rail as well. Iran is planning to use this port for transshipment to Afghanistan and Central Asia. Currently, Chabahar has the capacity to handle 2.1 million tons of cargo in one year. Once fully operated and operational, the maximum capacity would be 8 to 10 million tons of cargo per annum. This helps the region, including China, Pakistan, and others. On October 2017, India shipped some wheat out of 1.1 million tons commitment to Afghanistan via Chabahar port. The wheat was shipped from the Kandla port of India, the closest port with Chabahar at 650 nautical miles. Iran has also invited Pakistan and China to participate in Chabahar port investment. At this point, I would like to make, hopefully, a useful digression, if I may be allowed. The West always chastises Pakistan and India to resolve their territorial disputes by first joining their economies. They give us the EU model, an example of France and Germany having overcome their differences by putting economic, economic, uh, economics first. I think CPEC does exactly that. The world needs to see and support the CPEC efforts and encourage India to join in the bandwagon instead of creating propaganda against it. I'm trying to give you exact examples of how connectivity would mean less inequities, less poverty, and more development for all countries, not just for Pakistan and China. Let us examine the issues with the current Indian routes. India's trade with Afghanistan through Afghanistan, Iran border, in the West will probably remain a pipe dream for two reasons. Most of Afghan population lives in East and South, close to Pakistan border. Second, Afghanistan has poor infrastructure, making it very difficult to move cargo from West to East and South of the country. The distance between Chabahar and Gwadar port is about 72 kilometers. It has the potential, therefore, to become sister ports. China can also join Iran-Pakistan gas pipeline project to make it a true friendship project. And now coming to the regional aspect of this economic expansion. The 11 members of Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation, CARIC, consisting of Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, China, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, Mongolia, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan have enormous potential for cooperation with CPEC. The common factors among CPEC and CARIC is Pakistan and China. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, and China are signatories of the quad, uh, quadrilateral transit trade agreement signed in 1995. Tajikistan has also expressed desire to join the quadrilateral agreement on traffic in transit to use CPEC and Gwadar port. CPEC has the potential to become the overland Suez Canal of the 21st century. Central Asian nations are rich in energy and Pakistan and China are energy deficit. Hence, a regional energy market can be established. CPEC will complement CARIC's regional connectivity initiatives and would prove to be a milestone in regional development and connectivity. Let us now move beyond Pakistan's neighborhood and onto the international neighborhood. Russia, China, and Pakistan are on are an emerging new axis. In geopolitics, strategic realities can change with surprising speed. Russia and Pakistan ties are warming up in recent years. Russia lifted self-imposed arms embargo on Pakistan. In November 2014, Russia signed a landmark military cooperation agreement with Pakistan. The entire 2018 to 2018, 2013 to 2018 um, period saw tremendous parliamentary, political exchanges, and bilaterals between Russia and Pakistan, which, if contrasted to the Cold War days, was a very good development. Russian state-owned firm Rostec Corporation is planning to build 1,100 kilometers north-south gas pipeline in Pakistan at an estimated cost of $2.5 billion. 
This pipeline with a capacity of 12.4 billion cubic meters gas per year would connect LNG terminal in Karachi to Lahore. And it is ex also likely that the CPEC might be linked with the Russian-backed Euro-Asian uh, Economic Union. As a contrast, if one was to digress into other ports, the Long Beach port of the United States is the largest port of the U.S., which handles 80 million tons of cargo each year, which is just 20% of Gwadar's future capacity. It will depend on Pakistan and China to increase the transshipment volume incrementally in accordance with port expansion capacity programs in the future. Now, what is CPEC as such? And here, um, I want to go in to an evaluation of the different routes and projects to see what is causing the tension and what is causing the development as such. When you look at the CPEC energy route, and hopefully we will get to that. Here they are. Now, I want you to go through this list kindly, ladies and gentlemen, and maybe you might consider me as a Pakistani politician to have a certain perspective on it, but I'd certainly like your views on it as well. I only see development here. I see no tension. When we build coal fire power plants at Port Qasim, where's the tension? When we build Suki Kinari hydropower station, these are all energy projects. Where is the tension? It's only development. Hydro China, the, the, the list is long. I am not going to read all of them out. Now, these are the CPEC energy actively promoted projects. CPEC potential energy projects, all energy projects, hopefully bringing more development, not tensions. I go back. And the same for infrastructure, the same for the Gwadar, and these links, I don't think we have time, but otherwise I would have gone into each one of them. Uh, Eric, you're going to keep me on time, hopefully. Uh, social sector development, and these are, this is an open website for all of you to go and see later if you're interested. I do, however, want to go into the long-term plan of CPEC, and I do need your help to do that. So this is, ladies and gentlemen, the long-term plan for China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, 2017 to 2030. And this is also available on the website. Well, the Prime Minister has changed, but they need to change that on the website. <laughs> So if you go into the long-term plan, the definition of the corridor and building conditions, visions and goals, guidelines and basic principles, et cetera, et cetera, I would encourage you to, to go through this in detail later on if you're interested, because I think it gives a good example of how Pakistan is approaching this subject from a long-term point of view. What I think this plan shows is that it's not just a short-term plan uh, for economic growth in the next couple of years or five years or ten years. It, it gives a proper chart up till 2030 at least, which in fact is not that much. Uh, that's, it's around the corner, in fact. It's not that far off. And it comes up, it, it gives the challenges as well. It's, it's, a, it's a good document um, to go through um, um, if you're interested in the subject. And now returning to the PowerPoint presentation, these are your CPEC maps, ladies and gentlemen. This is your, this is your highways network of CPEC, clearly. This is your railways network of CPEC, and this is the CPEC fiber optic project also. All development, since I'm pushing the development here and I'm seeing absolutely no tensions coming out of this railway or highways and or the optics, frankly. Now, what is the latest news on CPEC? The latest news on CPEC is that 20% um, of the, the funds for CPEC are using Chinese loans and 80% are using FDI from China. That means that um, that is not adding to the government debt uh, which some may like to portray it as clearly. 
And five years, in five years, 22 early harvest projects have created thousands of jobs. 11 projects have been completed. 11 are in construction. And 22 projects' investment has been $18.9 billion. The bilateral trade has crossed $20 billion last year. And the power and infrastructure, which happened mostly in the last five years, was phase one. And I'm pleased to say that there is good continuity on that plan. And in this present government's time, we are going to hopefully see the second phase, which is industrialization and agriculture, as announced by the Prime Minister and his planning minister for Pakistan. The SEZ's special economic zones, the BOI and the Business Council of CPEC, which has been uh, put into place, are good initiatives which will take this forward. The focus is on relocation of labor-intensive export-led industries and SME collaboration. I do want to talk about, a little bit towards the end, um, some challenges to the CPEC. Firstly, CPEC is being undertaking, undertaken in a peculiar regional security environment, which is under constant spotlight due to terrorism and Afghan instability. In our case, geoeconomics and geopolitics are complementing each other. Therefore, CPEC and its security will move in tandem for this durable economic integration through enduring security and vice versa. For regional connectivity and integration, simmering Afghanistan situation is a challenge. Unstable Afghanis Afghan situation is being used by various terrorist organizations to create disturbance in Pakistan. Kulbushan Yadev is a case in point. A stable and prosperous Afghanistan suits Pakistan more than any other country in the world. Along the um, eastern border, Pakistan seeks good relationship with India on the basis of sovereign equality. Uh, sovereign, uh, sovereign equality. However, threat to CPEC mainly emanates from India, which includes both in kinetic as well as non-kinetic domains, i.e. propaganda supported and abetted by hostile elements. What are, ladies and gentlemen, the countermeasures to this threat that Pakistan has undertaken? There is comprehensive security mechanism in place for security of Chinese personnel in Pakistan. The mechanism includes Pakistan's armed forces, civilian, civil armed forces, law enforcement agencies supported by intelligence agencies. A special securities division has been established and over 15,000 security officials supported by additional 4,000 to 5,000 hired by provincial government are employed for security of personnel and projects of CPEC. Pakistan attaches highest importance to protection of Chinese persons and projects. As a result of the successful operation Zarbe Azab and Raddul Fasad, terrorists have been dislodged from our tribal areas. Pakistan and China have robust cooperation against three evils, terrorism, extremism, and separatism. Internationally, we are all continuing to work especially against emerging threats like Daesh. As far as financial security of Pakistan is concerned, because of its huge potential and policies and, uh, and stable security environment has been recording steady economic progress in the recent years. When seen from the prison of international institutions, Morgan Stanley Capital International classified Pakistan as an emerging market some time back. Washington Post declared Pakistan's stock market as the best market in Asia in 2016. Forbes, Marcus, uh, For Forbes magazine uh, declared that despite all its challenges, Pakistan has the potential to be a global turnaround story. I accept that currently Pakistan is experiencing tough economic challenges, and the economy will take some time to research, but I have tremendous belief and faith in my country's economic future. This I see as a temporary adjustment period, and we hope to surpass these challenges. It is pertinent to highlight that the first ever mega trade joint convoy uh, with Chinese from Kashgar to Gwadar was organized some time back. This pilot project Validated, validated the viability of economic order in the context of availability of infrastructure and secure environment and shall thus prove to be a catalyst for, of, for operationalization of CPEC. To conclude, I would like to say, um, um, yes, CPEC will therefore promote the economic development and political stability of Pakistan and will receive sincere support from China and hopefully from other countries as well. 
CPEC will harness regional connectivity and put economic, uh, economics first, making it incumbent for all other priorities of a territorial nature to be peacefully resolved with dignity like Kashmir. And if that doesn't happen, regional peace will suffer and, and inequities will grow. So, ladies and gentlemen, who is CPEC a win-win for? I believe it's a win-win for all. Who's blocking it will give it more impetus. I believe when people block projects like this, these projects get even more impetus. Why should it be seen in the context of why? Why, why sh should should it be seen in the context of reducing inequities for all versus a few? Because that is the need of the day. And how is the future of GDP growth rates linked to resolution of core disputes in the region in the context of the EU model and CPEC being central to that? I hope that I have explained that also. And I believe that CPEC therefore becomes the world's safest option. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ms. Memon, for this very extensive and positive outlook of uh, CPEC and its consequences, both in the short and long-term perspective. We will now give the opportunity to our two commentators to say a few words, and I would ask uh, uh, Ms. Jaiji to start. Uh, Ms. Jaiji is, uh, specializes in geopolitics Geopolitics of Sustainable Development at CIPRI. Uh, please. Hello. Just to check if this works. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Um, at CIPRI, um, we are not influenced, let's say, by Indian propaganda, but uh, it's part of our mandate to look at things. Um, not only neutrally, but also critically. Um, so I just will raise a few comments. Um, they're not necessarily negative, but I, I'd be interested to hear your perspective. Um, as it relates to the, the BRI as a whole, I think um, more and more analysts are realizing that you need to disaggregate between different types of projects, different countries. It's not useful to lump these all together to say that, you know, the developments and the investments in Pakistan are the same as the ones in Sri Lanka or the same as the ones in Greece or in Italy. So in this regard, I think the specific specificities of the, uh, the Pakistani case need to, um, are, are extremely important, and I think you laid them out very well. Uh, but at the same time, I think some of the broader concerns that people are having, especially here in Europe or in the West, um, I think they're, they're still worth thinking about. Um, and so those relate broadly um, to not only debt sustainability, but let's say environmental sustainability. Um, transparency, which I know even in Pakistan is, is something that people do talk about, the, the lack of clear uh, outlines that, that civil society can also access. Um, concerns related to still a, sort of a, not only an economic ec asymmetric relationship, but growingly uh, politically asymmetric relationships, um, local ownership. Um, and here I, I the, the last point I think is worth spending a little bit more time on. Um, I absolutely think that CPEC is going to be a game changer for, for Pakistan. Um, but I would hesitate to, to, to suggest that economic growth necessarily means inclusive economic growth. And I think there, this is, I know very close to your work uh, as well. And I think looking at the ways in which uh, economic growth may reduce absolute, in, um, you know, poverty. Mm -hmm. But those don't speak to relative issues. So not only the inequalities, uh, you know, income inequalities across classes, but also across regions, um, and making sure that the, the benefits are distributed in a way that does include um, all segments of the population. Um, I think that that's something that moving forward still, uh, you know, Pakistani politicians, Chinese coordinators and investors, I think that's something that if they could look more deeply at that, I think that that, that would be very useful even um, for changing the narrative regarding Chinese investments um, overall. Um, and in that, uh, on that last point, I think one other issue that, um, that I've seen, uh, and I have, uh, I made some trips to, to Pakistan and to India to, to, to look at this issue more specifically, and some of the concerns that were raised in Pakistan itself were um, the extent to which this would uh, contribute to corruption. And I think there, um, I'm not pessimistic, but I think the public administration aspects 
of this. Um, the what is the absorptive capacity of the Pakistani state? Um, you know, in terms of their ability to to manage these flows of funds, um, to make sure that these uh, these large investments don't get siphoned off into into uh, certain you know political. Uh, groups pockets or mm -hmm. certain elites pockets um, I think that making sure that these these issues are managed properly um, are, are very important um, on the regional angle I agree that, that there needs to be a rethink regarding uh, you know what is what is good for the region and what is not and and seeing all things in zero sum th mm -hmm. terms I think has not been helpful so this idea that uh, Chabahar mm -hmm. and, and Gwadar can work together mm -hmm. to promote broader regional um, Benefits. I think. I think that's a, that's a very strong sell. And if that could be brought out more, I think that that would that would be helpful for for the region generally. Um, but at the same time, it's it's also hard to see CPEC as a regional uh, economic project per se because it is almost exclusively focused on on the Pakistani economy. So in a sense, even in Afghanistan, you know, the argument that that this would increase regional connectivity, it's, it's hard to also even connect CPEC to Afghanistan. So how, those, the, how the trade is increasing uh, across the north-south um, corridors from Central Asia down uh, into, into Pakistan, I think that, that it's not clear that the, the regional aspect is really integrated into, this, uh, into the project. Um, I think I may just leave it there, uh, but um, I even though all the points I raised were sort of problematizing that narrative, I, I'm, I'm not pessimistic whatsoever, and I think that there's so much, um, so much of the, the positive side could be brought out more, especially in, in uh, European circles. So thank you very much for your thank presentation. You. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jaiji. I'd like to invite <coughs> Dr. Aspengren to say a few words and comment on, on the presentation. Uh, Dr. Aspengren is a research fellow at the... Um, Swedish Institute of International Affairs here in Stockholm. He also holds a PhD from uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies at London University and also been working as a research fellow at Uppsala University. That's right. So, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, organizers. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you, Ms. Menom, for this uh, uh, really interesting uh, presentation. As I mentioned to you earlier, I have very fond mem memories from Pakistan. I used to live there for a year and traveled all, all across the country. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, to be able to uh, raise some points uh, here today. Um, so uh, in general, I agree with you that um, um, CPEC is a, uh, is a massive undertaking um, and it's important for Pakistan in many, many ways. Um, I think um, especially the effort to increase power production is significant. Uh, and in many ways, I see it changing the dynam dynamic, not only between, I mean, in the relation, Pakistan-China relation, but in the region, in, the region in general. Um, but for me, it's, uh, it's also, we, we're currently trying to understand what CPEC is. I mean, there are a lot of mm -hmm. plans. Mm -hmm. Some have been implemented, but we're still in the process of getting to know what this is. So therefore, um, you know, um, I think it's cru crucial that we both... Um, uh, we, we really try to get the, the get to know the situation better, and um, uh, and I think you have provided a, a good uh, insight here. Um, you provided a very upbeat uh, sort of description of CPEC, um, and I agree with some of the things you mentioned, but I have some doubts with others. So I, I take this opportunity to engage with you on these issues. So. Um, First, when CPEC was launched, it was described and labeled as this sort of $62 billion mm -hmm. program. A bit later, it was reduced and revised downwards to the $48 billion. And now we're down at around $20 billion, I think, uh, latest figures. So to me, uh, it seems like the ambition of the plan has gradually been reduced. I wonder if that is correct assessment or if, if it's just a... a, a uh, sort of description that uh, that is incorrect. But more importantly, still on this sort of lower level, uh, you mentioned it yourself, Pakistan is facing some issues with regards to paying off uh, the debt, the loans and interests. Um, 
and it has just within the last couple of days uh, approached uh, Beijing to get some more aid to fund the project. And also, lately, it has approached Saudi Arabia in order for Saudi Arabia to finance a few of the projects within CPEC. So my first question to you is actually related to this. Uh, do you see, um, sorry, I should rephrase this. What signs do you see that the economic boom that you describe mm -hmm. uh, that CPEC is supposed to create for Pakistan is actually materializing? So that's my first question. And a related question to this is that um, for, for many years, even when, I think also when you were in government, uh, Pakistan had a growth rate of above 5%. Mm -hmm. Now that has been reduced downwards as well. Uh, so we see Pakistan at 3 three a bit more percent uh, on that level for coming years. So is there a risk you see that the sort of booms of CPEC uh, um, is coming too late, that, pa that CPEC pushes Pakistan to the brink economically before Pakistan can sort of reap the benefits of the entire program? Uh, second, uh, you touched on, upon this as well, uh, many of the projects uh, within CPEC has been carried out by Chinese state-owned firms or semi-state-owned semi firms. And we have seen some reports about uh, you know, Pakistani business communities being um, um, raising concerns about this. So my question is, if you see this as a, uh, you know, as a, fair business model uh, going moving ahead or if there are ways for Pakistan to renegotiate some of the deals in order to get a bigger share for local business communities. And third, um, you mentioned India, Indian uh, propaganda as an obstacle here. I'm not commenting on this, but uh, I think surely the debate about B the BRI has been vigorous also in other countries in Asia. We have seen that in Sri Lanka, we see that in Myanmar, in Malaysia. Um, so I know that even your own, uh, pre uh, the Minister for Textiles raised some, some concerns uh, previously. So um, in the process here, to what extent do you see that China has been um, responsive to those uh, you know, discussions and and suggestions of changing uh, the model a bit. Uh, also, I, I would have some questions about, you know, the, the ways that a very strong dependency, a Pakistani dependency on a big neighbor, a, a superpower, mm -hmm. if you see, if you have any concerns about that, I mean, in terms of Pakistan autonomy, um, sovereignty loss, other issues that have been discussed. Um, I would be interested to hear um, your views and take on that. Thank you very much to our two commentators, which also gave the, uh, uh, our key sp mm. note speaker a lot of questions. Yes. So, but may I add uh, one aspect uh, in this, but it's also for our, uh, or two aspects to our commentators and keynote speaker. First one is, is, is for you, Ms. Memon, is the kind of, we, we read reports about some uh, internal uh, demonstrations, even physical attacks, and you mentioned that against Chinese uh, workers, uh, Chinese institutions and infrastructure projects. Uh, especially in the Balochistan area. Mm -hmm. And also we now read about uh, China constructing a kind of mega city in Gwadar for their own workforce, a, a city of 500,000 it's mentioned. So do you see a risk of this creating more kind of domestic generated um, disturbances, uh, instability, even though in the presentation you mentioned that is political consensus favoring CPEC. And the other one, maybe to our two commentators, is the kind of regional aspect. Is because it's either two sides of the coin, uh, either the region, including maybe China as the key partner, could view this as an opportunity for engagement and, and economic benefit and regional stability. 
but it also could seen as a, a consolidation of Pakistani-China relation, which is really threatening India. So what, how, how do you have any take on that about how India is viewing this project? But maybe I hand the floor to you first, Ms. Bell. Okay, thank you very much. That's a lot of questions. So let's yeah. just start <laughs> with, uh, with the first uh, presentation. I really appreciate, first of all, I'd like to say that I, I, I appreciate this forum. I appreciate the frank conversation. And I understand it's in the positive uh, mode. Um, and, and I do appreciate that. Um, now, specifically in terms of um, the debt sustainability, like I discussed, I th I'm seeing that as a short-term uh, situation. And I'm seeing um, the economic stability um, coming into Pakistan and uh, like I explained, the, the loan versus the grant ratio is 20-80. Uh, so CPEC is definitely not adding to the debt issues. Uh, we have certain issues right now on the economic front. Like I said, I'm extremely positive and upbeat um, that um, the, the government of Pakistan will be able to handle that uh, soon uh, for the benefit of all its population. Um, so that's that. Now, you mentioned uh, transparency and corruption related and whether on the public administration side there's this absorptive capacity. Now, in terms of the civil service of Pakistan, I have tremendous faith in that because it's a well-established uh, civil service and uh, I believe there is an absorptive capacity on that front. Um, I realize that in the West, this question of transparency of, uh, of, of Chinese contracts, etc., comes in. We in Pakistan are not seeing it like that uh, because I think um, we have always seen uh, these projects also. We have tried to keep things as not just transparent, but there's a big drive in Pakistan currently against corruption, uh, which is a drive which is an international drive also. So this drive is happening in many countries, not just Pakistan specifically. But that is also a positive development as such, the drive ag against corruption. Um, and I'm seeing more and more transparency coming into these projects. I'm not seeing less of it. I'm seeing hopefully more of it. Um, and and we, are, we, are, we are okay. We are happy and we're good with the Chinese model. As I'm going to come to your points later. I'm just going to go through yours. On the environmental side, I believe there were certain concerns which were raised, uh, which are always raised uh, with, uh, with such projects. But I think they're being handled, and I think that they are part of the project descriptions and in, the, in terms of the, um, e the, the signed agreements, they are hopefully sensitive to them. Um, it is important to be sensitive to the environmental um, uh, side, and I think that this government is taking uh, initiatives on the environmental side, uh, which will add, which will, which will, not, uh, which will, will, which will increase um, you know, the positive impact versus any negative impacts on the environment. In terms of local ownership, I think those issues that are raised um, perhaps uh, have a certain uh, objective. And we are not seeing any local ownership problems as such. And perhaps what is raised in the media um, by certain elements uh, is done so uh, to negatively impact the CPEC uh, rather than as real issues. Um, and there has been more and more emphasis on the local aspects, but especially in Balochistan, I, I will come to your question specifically, but there's been more and more emphasis in what the CPEC is generating for the lo local communities, and there's more sensitivity on the local communities actually gaining from CPEC. Uh, so I'm, s I'm actually quite upbeat about that, that the local communities will actually gain uh, versus lose. And I if there have been certain things in the media, like I said, that's more a certain mindset, which is um, perhaps, you know, negative to this entire growth phenomena that CPEC will develop for Pakistan. Now, this is a very important question about the trickle down, and we were talking about it, about it earlier as well. There's a complete uh, enormous potential uh, for the trickle down. It has to have, the trickle down has to happen, um, and it has to reduce inequities and improve the poverty alleviation program. Now, I'm seeing this going forward as, as something that the Pakistan government will be hopefully are concentrating on. And so I think it's important for us as Pakistan to give these numbers out in the public as to what kind of reductions we are seeing on the poverty side. And if perhaps we haven't in the past, we need to, uh, so that we can show uh, in terms of um, impact on poverty alleviation, what exactly, and it's very easy to gauge that. In fact, it's not difficult, because as you're well aware, and we had this discussion in the morning as well, uh, and, and in fact, your suggestion that came in in the morning, 
uh, was that there is a tremendous, there is a, a database of households um, within Pakistan called the National Socioeconomic Registry. And within that, it is very easy to gauge uh, whether poverty levels of certain areas which have CPEC operated projects is going up or down. Uh, so the measurement tool exists right now. Um, hopefully when that measurement tool is utilized, then we will be able to show uh, within Pakistan and outside Pakistan exactly what kind of trickle down is happening. Um, it is a question of utilizing and showing uh, internally and externally uh, the poverty rates. The poverty rates, I mean, it, it, the indicators are improving, but to link it directly to CPEC, I think that effort needs to be made. Now, coming to the regional uh, side, I'm happy that you agree that, you know, uh, perhaps we don't talk about this complementary aspect of Chabahar and, and Gwadar as much as we should. And we should not see it as a zero-sum game. And I'm, I'm looking at all four ports as contributing to the regional uh, growth engine. Um, I think we need to talk about it more. We need to uh, emphasize that aspect more so that these apprehensions uh, on Gwadar reduce. Uh, because it's in our hands to do that. We, we have to lead on, on that. Um, I feel that countries need to bandwagon more on this CPEC. And we have been encouraging other partners. And there have been, I know, I, I'm aware personally that the European ambassadors have been invited to uh, look into this as well. And they've been given briefings on CPEC as well. So the more... Uh, not the more uh, well in terms of regional let's just look at the regional side i went through a, a quite a descriptive regional economic benefits of cpec uh, but it really is the will of the regional states whether they are willing to bandwagon if they have the will then there will be a way because i've clearly demonstrated that there is a clear-cut way of benefiting from from cpec uh, whether they are currently doing that i believe they should be doing that more i i don't think uh, they're doing it. Uh, they're doing it to the extent that they should be. Um, th there needs to be more uh, bandwagoning than what is happening right now. Um, in terms of what CPEC is, uh, perhaps, well, I mean, internally, we talk about CPEC all the time. <laughs> so we in Pakistan are discussing CPEC invariably a lot politically in Parliament, um, on media. Uh, and we're seeing CPEC projects develop in front of our eyes. Um, so really, maybe we should be doing more information sharing so that the world sees more of what we already see uh, as benefits. And the question that was raised on the ambition of the 60, now coming to your presentation, in fact, I've, I've jumped into yours, uh, is from the 62 to 22, I don't think it's, uh, it's a reduction. It's just a phasing. So perhaps this is perhaps the fa first phase. Um, I'm not seeing it as a reduction. I'm seeing it simply as phasing. And this is, and it's good that we are putting things down in phases so that we can have more uh, achievable targets as such. Um, in terms of the GDP growth rate, you have correctly identified, um, unfortunately, um, what the situation is. But like I said, I'm upbeat about the economy, uh, even though we are seeing uh, certain indicators definitely going down in the recent history, uh, but generally um, the government seems confident and we, um, we hope that the government will be able to steer us out of this economic crisis um, and therefore CPEC really uh, would not be taking us to the brink before we reap the benefits. CPEC would be uh, adding to the economic uh, growth. Uh, that's how we see it. I, I don't see it because I'm not seeing that debt uh, burden increase due to CPEC. Uh, clearly, I've given you that 2080 rule, uh, a percentage uh, of loans and, and, and grants, etc. Now, um, whether we consider Chinese firms state-owned, um, you know, to be a fair business model, I mean, that's what the government of Pakistan has negotiated. So, yeah, my government negotiated um, in 2018 to thir thir 13 to 18, and the current government, which is, of course, again, my government, uh, is negotiating to the best of its capability. Um, I, I believe that's, that's the best negotiations we have on ground, and we have to take it forward. Um, whether China is responsive, China and Pakistan have a relationship which is perhaps difficult to explain, and I did say, uh, you know, sweeter than honey and higher than the K2 and deeper than the Arabian Sea, but these are not just words for us. Uh, we have grown up with these uh, symbols, and I think the 
Pakistan, China, people-to-people -people contact, like I said in my presentation, cannot be underestimated. It's huge. Um, we, have, we have grown up with this narrative. We believe in this narrative from the core of our heart. And therefore, we believe that China would not do anything <laughs> to disrespect Pakistan's sovereignty at any point. This is a belief system. I mean, it's difficult to explain this in other terms. We have not seen, God forbid, any interference in Pakistan's sovereign matters by China. That's not China's way of doing business, as far as we're concerned. We have not seen that side at all. Uh, China does not interfere in Pakistan's affairs. Pakistan does not interfere in Chinese affairs. And China has this long-standing policy of non-interference in other people's uh, state affairs. So we are extremely comfortable um, with, uh, with China uh, as such. And, um, and I, like I said, that's, in my presentation, that's also a belief system which has been built over the years, not just CPEC. It goes back to many, many uh, decades of a history with China which has built that uh, relationship of trust Respect, deep respect for each other, uh, and deep respect for each other's sovereign, um, you know, uh, sovereignty as such. Um, you also talked about uh, Pakistan becoming dependent on China. I mean, I don't see it as a dependency. I'm seeing this as um, this is a partner. Um, China is seen in Pakistan uh, and Pakistani political circles as not a partner that is trying to create unequals in any way. It has always shown us tremendous respect, and we don't see us getting uh, dominated or dependent on China. We're seeing this as, as good partnership, as on, on, on good footing as such, on respectable footing as such. Um, you talked about the, um, the internal demonstrations against Chinese workers. Yes, we have had a few issues of security concerns to the Chinese personnel, uh, but those are elements uh, which are trying to sabotage the CPEC. That is not the that is not the people of Pakistan. The people of Pakistan have tremendous love for the people of China. So I cannot imagine that any Pakistani would try and hurt any Chinese personnel. I I do imagine that yes, some extremist uh, te uh, infiltration and terrorist infiltration inside Pakistan by uh, by neighboring state well by india specifically let's i mean i'm i'm going to be open about it i'm seeing this as indian uh, machinery working inside pakistan you mentioned balochistan those were all and i gave you the the name kulpishan yadav i mean that's what he, his mandate was and that's uh, that's unacceptable that they are trying to create issues within pakistan to sabotage uh, the cpec uh, by attacking chinese personnel uh, and so, therefore, the government of Pakistan, whether it was the previous government or the current government, uh, the state of Pakistan has taken uh, measure, measures, security measures, to ensure the secu uh, security of the Chinese personnel. And I have, I have personally witnessed how um, well China has dealt with these issues because they understand um, our concerns uh, that we, we, their, their, the safety of their personnel is very key to this whole project. So. I explained that we've got a new division within the armed forces specifically mm -hmm. trying to handle their security. We're very sensitive on this because we have tremendous partnership with China, uh, which goes back b beyond before CPEC, in fact. Now, you also mentioned um, whether there's any risk of domestic instability. No, like I said, those are just elements which are trying to purposefully sabotage Pakistan's efforts, but from outside, not from within. I'm seeing no within issues. Um, I think I shall, hmm? I th hopefully I have tried to <laughs> answer so many questions and again, an upbeat uh, assessment from me, but that's only because I've personally seen that on ground uh, with, w when, I was, uh, when I was in government and even now when I am not in government, I'm seeing that. Thank you very much. I'd like to remind us all about that we are conducting this uh, ISDP forum under what is called the Chatham House rules, which means that you can use the information that we are, but not to attribute it to any of the speakers uh, um, concerning what has been said and stated. I also had a, a few questions to our two commentators that I would like to, to say a few words, and then we open up the floor for uh, questions from you all here. Uh, so just indicate that you want to ask a question. I will try to keep track on who is first and second, etc. So, yeah, please. Uh, if I take, uh, I mean, I, th I thank you for your responses. I, I 
Um, maybe we, I have a few things that we could discuss mm -hmm. later. Um, but um, to pick up on, on Matt's um, question about um, the Indian, Indian side, uh, w how they view it, um, I mean, there, there's no representative from the Indian <laughs> side on the stage. But um, as I see it, uh, uh, I think there are two issues for, the f f uh, I mean, from New Delhi side. Uh, one is um, one is the sovereignty issue, which relates to some parts of CPEC, uh, the, the the infrastructure planned for um, uh, Gilgit Baltistan, uh, which is in a disputed, uh, uh, contested area, uh, from the Indian perspective. Uh, so that th there is a there is a sovereignty issue from the Indian side, but also of course the 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 sense that um, you know the maritime Silk Road, uh, the the maritime component of the BRI which links um, you know uh, Hambantota and Gwadar and um, other seaports and the Maldives as well, plus CPEC uh, creates an impression in India of being encircled. you know encircled yeah. by Chinese interests. So that is uh, also an issue. So uh, whether that is true or not, uh, I'm not in a position to say, but uh, that is absolutely uh, an issue from the Indian side. But also that, um, uh, uh, that um, um, you know, the, the, the depth level and instability that that might create in neighboring countries might lead to, you know, for more fragile states um, to, uh, to to be uh, um, uh, placed in a very difficult position, and instability in those countries uh, m may be, you know, problematic for India as well. So these are a couple of issues that have been brought up um, uh, from the Indian side. Do you have any comments on this one? Um, well, I, I don't have so many comments uh, from the in Indian side. I, I can't represent their views. No, um, no. But uh, in the past, when we when we did make a trip to India regarding CPEC, I mean the um, the viewpoint was wholesale negative. Um, so I mean there was a lot of concerns about um, about the disputed territories, about the string of pearls, so called. Um, but there, I think it, it's so much uh, it's so much a, a narrative that that could change. I don't know if it has changed in yeah. the past year. I think there has been some um, reduction of tensions between between China and India uh, to a small extent, but I'm not sure uh, how much how far that's been going. So I think, yeah, the shift in narrative, uh, I think that's still possible because those are not necessarily rooted in, in on-the-ground uh, realities. If it, it could be connected to specific concerns, I think that, that that's that would be important to say what exactly is it that we can do to mitigate a specific, uh, you know, geopolitical or, or practical concern regarding these investments. Um, and just one small point about the, the attacks or, or the, um, you know, the workers being in Bantustan and in, in Gwadar. Um, and this is where I think it's, it is true that China and Pakistan have a very unique relationship. Um, so it's it's very difficult to say that some of the problems that are faced by Chinese in in let's say in the Central Asian states are the same in, in Pakistan. I think it's it is different because the societies have a very different um, perspective in terms of the the people to people connections. But even there, I, I just to be you know uh, sort of this analyst perspective, I, I would be curious to see because as far as I know, many Pakistanis have not actually encountered. Chinese on a face-to-face -face level to a large extent and to the extent that you know there will be Chinese more Chinese workers or more Chinese coming in whether or not you know there could be elements of discontent if people feel that labor contracts are not going to Pakistanis but are going to Chinese workers I think those things that need to be carefully looked at to make sure that any tangents can be managed properly Thank you very much we now open up for questions from uh, from the audience please I have one from Back there, it's Marianne, yes. Could you please <laughs> take the microphone and please identify yourself shortly? Yeah, I did, yes. <laughs> uh, but I will repeat it. Uh, Marianne Lanarsa, Lund University, um, and also the think tank MENA.se. It's Middle East, North Africa, MENA is there. So. Um, thank you very much for very interesting presentations and, and also the questions from the discussions. Um, I have um, 
some questions and remarks, and that is, the first one is the overlapping of Shanghai Cooperation Organization and this new organization. Also, if you look at SAREC and, uh, um, and you look at uh, uh, other aspects that you brought up. And then again, um, it was mentioned about Saudi Arabia because you mentioned most about energy cooperation with uh, Central Asia and Iran and so on. But you have also the role of Saudi Arabia, which have become very uh, clear, not least uh, with the new agreements between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Um, and my third thing is, I think it's, uh, you have already, and we have already mentioned it, that is about the I Iranian Indian uh, cooperation uh, at, with the port project and the competition. So this about overlapping and competition, uh, I will look at that as uh, quite important perspectives. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to okay, yeah, I just want to go back to the constitutional position of Gilgit Baltistan that India keeps pointing towards. I think it's um, Pakistan has always respected uh, the UN Security Council resolutions on uh, Kashmir and India has not, as a matter of fact. And so there is no way that we have done anything unconstitutional or we have done anything illegal in terms of international law on the Gilgit Baltistan side. We have respected all international covenants on that side. However, on the Indian side, the Indians recently, if you heard Mr. Modi in his uh, drive to get himself re-elected in the, in the uh, upcoming elections, he has broken all international rules. And he is, he is talking of <laughs> making uh, Indian-held Kashmir a part of India, which is illegal internationally. I feel that the international community must take a stance on that issue uh, we, because we would require uh, the international community to comment on that. Whilst Pakistan has not done that, India is blatantly doing that and it should be stopped from doing that. And we would require the international community to step up on that with us and help us on that. Now, yes, there is an encirclement feeling. Well, why don't they turn that into the narrative, like you correctly pointed out, into a bandwagon? And I, and I am not so hopeful on that side, if I may uh, uh, be frank, that currently in the current election scenario, and the narrative that Mr. Modi is going on projecting, I'm not seeing very positive um, narratives coming out of India for some time. Because if Mr. Modi continues on this extremist drive of his, then his whole Pakistan bashing um, will, ex will make that narrative even worse, will not make the narrative any better. So if he continues being in the driving seat, I'm not seeing any improvement on that narrative, unfortunately. Uh, I have to be, I, I am optimist, but I am a realist as well, and I'm not seeing much on that. Now, as far as um, the um, Chinese, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying in terms of Chinese uh, labors, uh, the, the workers, and whether, you know, uh, in future, um, if they would be uh, impacting perhaps the, the local side. But Pakistan is very careful on that, and China would also be careful on that, because pa China understands Pakistan's position. China would not put Pakistan in any compromised uh, position. So I expect um, continued, uh, this, th I, I don't see any local resentment as such, because there would be none. Uh, that, that's my view. Uh, on that question about Carrick and SEO, I feel that there's a complementarity on the two. Uh, whether it's a duplication, I don't know. I don't know enough about it to be able to, uh, to, to, to comment. But I see it as complementarity, not duplication as such. Um, and on our bilaterals with Saudi Arabia, just like we have good ties with uh, China, we have some Islamic uh, ties with Saudi Arabia, and we have economic ties with Saudi Arabia, which are, uh, which are not recent, which also go back a long way in our history. And uh, we expect Saudi Arabia has always been there for Pakistan, and Pakistan will also always be there for Saudi Arabia in the same way. Uh, so I, I see positivity coming out of that. And in terms of the Iran connection, and I, I try to explain how Iran should be benefiting from this whole thing in my presentation, and I try to explain how uh, stability in Afghanistan would help uh, the CPEC. So it's in our interest, and it's in everyone's interest, frankly, to create that stability in Afghanistan, and it's in our interest to get more regional bandwagoning happening as such. Any more questions from, please, Oscar? Uh, 
Hi, um, I'm Oscar Gustafsson, editor at the ISDP. Um, I was just um, interested um, in this aspect that you say about the relationship between China and Pakistan not being compromised. Um, now, obviously, the CPEC route goes into the Xinjiang region, um, where there is a Muslim minority people, the Uyghur population. And <clears throat> there's been a lot of criticism from the West and in Europe um, about the worker camps that are in this area. And uh, there's been little or no criticism from a lot of, of Islamic countries, aside from maybe Erdogan's uh, Turkey. Uh, we made a couple of remarks uh, criticizing the, uh, the treatment of this uh, minority population. But I'm just considering that in future relations, should there be any more information that comes out about uh, the treatment of um, China towards this area, and Pakistan makes certain criticisms, could that economic relationship be compromised? Yeah, I, may, may I answer? Yes, yeah, of course. Um, this is an important aspect that has been raised recently um, internationally as well. And I feel that uh, Pakistan's stance on this is that um, we expect China, we expect China to take care of its uh, populations. We don't like to interfere in China's internal affairs. Um, and China, like I said earlier, does not interfere in Pakistan's internal affairs. So the sovereignty rule applies there. And we expect China to manage that situation positively and, and, and well. And we would not like to comment on it because uh, we have traditionally nothing to do with CPEC. And this is something we were discussing earlier also. Beyond, before CPEC, uh, our relationship with China uh, has been such that uh, we respect each other's sovereignty and uh, we don't comment. So I don't see this really coming up later as well. Uh, you might criticize China on certain things. Pakistan has never criticized China on, on, on certain issues beyond CPEC, not just because they are, um, they are, uh, they are massive, um, you know, they're providing massive FDI for Pakistan. Even before that, before the FDI came in, we just don't have that kind of a relationship with China. And I'm not seeing that going, going forward. Though I do hope that, um, I, I'm, I'm sure that China would handle things uh, accordingly. Okay, I think I have a question or a comment from Henrik. Well, I, I, I think, I mean, there, wa there was some debate recently in Pakistan about this interview that was made uh, uh, with your prime minister yes. when he re ignored that issue that uh, was just brought up here, uh, saying that he had no you know, knowledge about what is going on in Xinjiang. So I think there is something to discuss here. But uh, what I wanted to say is that, I mean, I think it's remarkable in a discussion like this and a sort of sign of the times that we haven't even mentioned the, U the role of the US. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think that is something that I, uh, it's it's perhaps another seminar and presentation, but I just want to, to bring that up. It's important. <laughs> it's important. Yeah, we have a question from the gentleman over here. Uh, Richard C. from uh, SimTrader. I have a question uh, for Mrs. Memo. Um, it is uh, it concerns um, the, the protection of the Chinese workers. So I understood from what you said that, that the, there has been a new division in the uh, in the armed force in mm -hmm. Pakistan to protect the Chinese workers. So my question is that the, uh, uh, are they acting as a, as a guards where where Chinese people are working, or or, or you, you have identified who are the supporters, and then you go in to to to, to wipe out the supporters. So, so, so this is the question. And then also, uh, mm. are you making that uh, just with Pakistan security or in cooperation with China? May I? Yeah. Yes, please. So, I mean, my understanding because uh, I, of the situation is that that division has come up uh, in order to protect uh, wherever the Chinese workers are moving. Uh, so, yeah, it is for their personal protection that division has specifically come in. Um, how they're functioning, of course, they're not going to be uh, public about their, th this is a military situation, so they're not, certainly not going to be public about it, but they are protecting them 
um, uh, under all circumstances, day and night. Uh, we ha we, I, I just want to digress a little bit because I think that point was missed about uh, whether we have contact, enough contact, whether Pakistanis have enough contact. Yeah, we see these, the Chinese, they're part of our community. They're not, it, this impression that they're just in one zone uh, cut off from the rest of the population. No, they're working in the, <laughs> inside Pakistan. So of course Chinese and Pakistanis are, are coordinating and, and we see them working. I've personally seen them working day and night. I'm very impressed with their work day and night, 24 by seven they work. Um, but coming back to your question, um, I think uh, going forward, um, this um, the infiltration which is coming from outside Pakistan in order to create instability inside Pakistan, uh, the armed forces have been managing that in the in the in the in the two um, the 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 ones that I identified, the operations that I named in my presentation, and we've had success. We've had tremendous success. Uh, Pakistan has been um, has taken. Uh, a lot of um, hit on its on the on the on the civilian side as well as the military side. We've lost close to about seventy thousand uh, people on the civil and the military side, um, um, and so this is an issue which is very very critical for Pakistan. We have seen tremendous success on the um, on getting rid of the extremists from within Pakistan who infiltrated Pakistan from outside, um, and. We, the, the operations that have happened in the past, uh, they, they've shown a success. So there's, the armed forces are, f are managing on different fronts. Unfortunately, they have to manage on the Indian side as well. Now, since I'm sitting in Sweden and I'm sitting, I mean, in terms of the international community, Pakistan would really ex appreciate and uh, would appreciate the support of the international community to stop Indian aggression on our line of control, because that would obviously help uh, Pakistan's uh, stability. Now, on one side, the armed forces are handling the Indian aggression on the line of control. We've seen uh, deaths on that side, civilians as well as military, but most so, so specifically innocent civilian lives on the line of control on the Pakistani side have, you know, um, and, and you saw in the recent skirmishes with India um, due to their elections, uh, their fake claims about the F-16s, et cetera, et cetera, and how we have shown tremendous responsibility um, and um, and dignity on, on dealing with that those, those issues. So hopefully, I mean not hopefully. Let's 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 hope that India understands that it can't keep going on that aggression aggression uh, aggressive situation on that side uh, till their elections are over. Um, we're not very hopeful that things will improve. So yeah, the armed forces are fighting on different sides. It's not just the Chinese that we're taking care of. We're taking care of getting rid of, ex and we've had tremendous success. So things are getting much, much better. And we discussed that this morning as well uh, with the general that, uh, you know, 10 years back, the, what the situation was five years back, we are seeing continuous improvement. And we're very proud of that improvement. May I? take on from what you said, Henrik, about we haven't mentioned United mm. States, we haven't mentioned very much about the European Union and Europe mm. as well. And, and, uh, and you mentioned this morning, yes. uh, Ms. Memon, that you were a little bit surprised mm. during your travels here in Europe to yes. find out that there is some kind of resentment towards apprehension. Uh, or apprehension towards Chinese uh, investment, mm. infrastructure project, not only uh, the CPEC, mm. but uh, in Africa and other places where there seems to be uh, using these as a pressure tool to gain political influence in very different areas from the recognition to Taiwan, to the harbor in Sri Lanka, to what have you. And I think there is, and we also have this case about the telecom company uh, UI Way, um, which is calling uh, for re stricter regulations uh, in <coughs> Europe and in United States. So there seems to be a, a kind of wave or a tendency mm. for scrutinizing Chinese overseas activity in relation to the BRI project as a whole. Yes. And is there a risk that this, and, and you have now painted a rather positive picture of CPIC in relation to what's happening in Pakistan, but Pakistan is also dependent on European Union and United States. So is there a risk that we will have a situation where 
Pakistan would be pressured from European Union, United States, uh, and squeezed between kind of China and Europe? Well, let's hope it's not going to be like that, and let's hope that we maintain our relations uh, with each of those um, allies. I mean, European Union is very important to Pakistan's growth as well, and so is America, and so is China. We have bilateral relations with each one of mm -hmm. the countries of Europe as well. So we are trying to maintain them, um, and we will. Uh, I'm pretty confident that the government of Pakistan uh, will maintain good relations on every level. I mean, that's the objective of any foreign policy. Yeah. It's not uh, to get pressured by anyone. Um, I have, um, like I said, I, in my recent travels, met this apprehension. And as far as Pakistan is concerned, coming back to your point, the China already has a lot of in political influence on Pakistan traditionally, and because of the Chinese Pakistan, so it's got nothing, I think it's beyond CPEC, it's much more historic with us. We vote with them on many issues, though they vote with us and for us on many issues. They have been extremely supportive of our concerns internationally on international forum, and we have been very sensitive to their concerns. So in any case we have, if they needed to create political influence, they'd, they've already done that in Pakistan, and we've already done that with them. I mean, it's a very respectful situation from pre-CPEC days. So whether CPEC will add to that? No, I don't think CPEC will add to that. CPEC is just the economic side. Political, like I said, we've always had great, um, great respect for each other's voting positions, and we do vote similarly, I believe, in international forums. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to probably vote, because it's not just the investment. It is sweeter than honey and deeper than the oceans. <laughs> <laughs> and higher than K2. Higher than K2, let's <laughs> yeah. not forget. Okay. One final question from back of the room, please. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question. Um, since I had like one year experience uh, working a uh, uh, one belt, one road project in Sri Lanka, uh, which called the Lotus Tower. And uh, when um, my question is like, uh, when I was there, I remember uh, last year the Hambantota port rented to China for 99 years. Suddenly, this one belt, one road initiative uh, started to be in a very negative image in the whole international media. So, as also you mentioned about the propaganda from India, when I was work there, they are tel they are, there's a rumor in Sri Lanka society says like this television tower is like a, a station to spy India, which is don't know this rumor is based on yeah. which resources. So I was, wa I was uh, want to ask you like, is there any solution to change this one belt, one road initiative, this negative image to a positive image? Or like, is China, this Chinese government or like a Sri Lanka, uh, no, is it like a Pakistan government can use a bad narrative way, use this bad narrative way to defeat this kind of international media's influence. That's I my think I'm doing that in Sweden and Stockholm today. <laughs> 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 That's the whole point. I think we need to um, complement each other's, um, you know, if, if, if the narrative on the BRI is going negative, uh, the CPEC positively impacts that, um, that uh, a good narrative. And by hopefully projecting what I see as, as the reality of CPEC, um, though, of course, yeah, I, I do understand that you might consider me a bit upbeat. Um, uh, but hopefully this will add to the positivity around BRI. Um, but I'm sure China is, is handling uh, the negative impressions quite well. China uh, has a huge uh, uh, machinery to handle that. And I have full confidence in Chinese diplomacy, uh, which is extremely uh, efficient and extremely, uh, how can I say, uh, yeah, efficient. I'm sure they will handle that exceptionally well. Yeah, yeah, sorry, um, just briefly, I, I think, you know, there are, there are legitimate, legitimate concerns about some of the uh, parts of the BRI, and I think that's important for us to realize, and I think that there are also, you know, concerns within the European Union, for example, about ways of uh, Chinese interaction with certain states and not the, the entire union and so forth. So, um, even though there, there, the narrative can be, you know, addressed, but some concerns are legitimate and needs to be raised. And then it's up to China and its partners to find a, a way to, to sort of counter that, uh, that, uh, that narrative. But um, from my perspective, there are legitimate concerns. We need to we come to an end. Um, clock is ticking when you're having fun. Um, 
And this has been a very inspiring afternoon. Uh, we have been uh, uh, intrigued by the deep knowledge and understanding and also the, the, the uh, this sheer scale of this uh, CPIC uh, project, which is massive, huge. And, and uh, uh, it will m hopefully uh, have a major positive impact, not only on Pakistan, but also on the region and regional stability, because I think that's what it So I think we all uh, can share with a big hand to our three uh, contributors, uh, Ms. Memon, uh, Dr. Aspengren, and uh, Ms. Jaiju. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.